Toyin Falola, A History of Nigeria. Delve into the rich and complex history of Nigeria through Toyin Falola's Ya History of Nigeria. Be captivated by its journey over the past 10,000 years, from the ancient rock shelters of 9000 BCE to the vibrant, diverse nation it has become today. Discover the various societies, cultures, empires, and political structures that evolved throughout its history and shaped the region. Learn about the impact of European colonialism, the rise of Islam, and Nigeria's fight for independence, as well as the challenges the nation faces in modern times. A compelling exploration of both the triumphs and challenges of this dynamic country awaits. Pre-colonial Nigeria Unraveled The history of the region known today as Nigeria involves a range of societies, states, and empires that evolved over the last 10,000 years. With the first evidence of human presence dating back to 9000 BCE, the Late Stone Age saw the emergence of rock shelters in the region. Permanent village settlements formed between 400 and 1000 BCE, marking a shift from a hunting and gathering lifestyle to an agricultural one. The ongoing decentralization of the Igbo villages was adapted by the British colonizers later on. Beginning in the 10th century CE, various societies adopted centralized political structures, establishing kingdoms similar to Athens and Sparta. The growth of these states was further catalyzed by Islam, which connected the region commercially and academically. An integrated regional economy emerged by 1500 CE as both decentralized and centralized states established political and trade relationships. The notion of pre-colonial Nigeria is an oversimplification of a diverse and intricate historical tapestry that unfolded over millennia. In reality, the area comprising modern Nigeria has been home to numerous societies, states, and empires, most of which bear little direct connection to the Nigeria we know today. The evidence of human presence in the region first appears around 9000 BCE with the discovery of two ancient rock shelters. Such shelters were typical of the Late Stone Age, which persisted until about 2000 BCE. As the region shifted from hunter-gatherer lifestyles to agriculture between 400 and 1000 BCE, permanent village settlements formed, and food resources became centralized. Notably, Igbo villages were characterized by decentralization, with age-based hierarchies guiding political decisions within individual settlements. Groups of villages convened for market exchanges and intra-village meetings, an arrangement that would persist until the era of British colonial rule. Around the 10th century CE, some societies in the region began developing centralized political structures, resulting in the emergence of kingdoms ruled by king-like figures. These urban centers fostered politics, trade, and culture reminiscent of ancient Greek city-states like Athens and Sparta. Yet, these entities did not meld into any single nation resembling present-day Nigeria. The introduction of Islam in the region played a vital role in the evolution of centralized states. In the late 11th century CE, states led by Hausa and Kanuri rulers, ethnic groups still present in Nigeria today, embraced Islam as their official religion. This spiritual shift forged connections to the broader Islamic world, both commercially and academically. By 1500 CE, the region had given birth to an integrated economy marked by political and trade relationships between decentralized village groupings and centralized states. This vibrant, ever-changing landscape sparks curiosity about the rich, multifaceted history that lives within Nigeria's borders today. The Evolution of Nigerian Slavery Slavery in Nigeria dates back to before the 15th century, with the region being connected to the Trans-Saharan slave trade route. The growth of Hausa-speaking states and the neighboring Borno Empire led to wars and raids aimed to capture slaves to increase economic and political influence. Southern Nigeria witnessed the arrival of European traders in the late 15th century, leading to a significant slave trade boom. Slaves became crucial social classes, playing various roles in society and, in some cases, amassing power and wealth. Harsher conditions awaited slaves sold off to European traders, with Nigeria's coast playing a significant role in the exportation of slaves to the Americas and the Middle East. 
As early as the pre-15th century, Nigeria was deeply intertwined in the institutionalized trans-Saharan slave trade route. Over the years, this connection strengthened as the trade route expanded eastward into newer markets, providing a lucrative source of income for the emerging northern Nigerian states and the adjacent Borno Empire. Events in southern Nigeria took a different course, with the area's slave trade accelerating upon the arrival of European traders in the late 15th century. Eventually, acquiring and exporting slaves to European traders became the main source of revenue for many of the southern states. As the 17th century unfolded, slavery reshaped the region's political and economic landscape. In many African societies, including Nigeria, slaves constituted critical social classes. Most were war captives forcibly removed from their homeland, stripped of their culture and language, and reliant on their owners for survival. However, local African slavery was generally less brutal compared to the chattel slavery developing in the Americas. African slaves often worked alongside their masters and integrated into their new societies, with some even marrying their owners. In the southern Oyo Empire, slaves played essential roles in military and bureaucratic positions, often becoming slave raiders and traders themselves. Some amassed wealth and political power. However, slaves exported to European traders faced much harsher conditions. Between 1600 and 1800, Roughly 1,473,100 slaves were shipped from Nigeria's southern coast to the Americas and the Middle East, with a staggering 42% of all African slaves originating from these ports between 1675 and 1730. Uniting Nigeria, Caliphate and Commerce Throughout the 19th century, Nigeria's regions remained diverse in ethnicity, language, and religion. The Sokoto Caliphate united Muslim northern Nigeria with parts of the religiously diverse south, promoting societal transformation and prospering commerce. Sharia law united fragmented communities under the banner of Islam, creating cultural unity among northern Nigerians. In contrast, southern Nigeria, which relied heavily on the slave trade, struggled economically after the British abolished slavery in 1807. The suffering Oyo Empire lost power, but an economic recovery emerged due to the focus on palm oil exports. Despite the ban on slavery, the slave trade persisted for labor in the palm oil industry, resulting in an improved social position for some laborers. This economic and cultural shift led to increased British involvement in Nigeria, eventually introducing government and military forces into the region. Colonial Conquest of Nigeria in the early 19th century, the abolition of slavery and resulting economic chaos led to widespread instability in southern Nigeria. To protect their interests in the palm oil trade, Britain sought to stabilize the region by sending military, missionaries, and political officials. This era coincided with the scramble for Africa, where European empires like Britain, France, and Germany vied for control over the continent's resources. Despite the presence of British forces since the 1850s, complete colonization only occurred a half-century later. Britain took advantage of the collapsed Oyo Empire and power vacuums in the southern region, using treaties to establish protectorate status over local leaders in exchange for support. The British also used military superiority to forcefully claim land. By the end of the 19th century, southern Nigeria was subjected to British rule, with the Southern Nigeria Protectorate being declared in 1900. To prevent the Sokoto Caliphate, the only remaining indigenous political threat, from joining forces with the expanding French colonial empire, Britain orchestrated a four-year conquest, culminating in the assassination of Caliph Muhammadu Atahiru in 1903. The Sokoto Empire was annexed, forming the Northern Nigeria Protectorate, completing the colonization of Nigeria. Resilience amid colonialism Established in 1914, the Colony and Protectorate of Nigeria operated under the dual mandate system by Governor-General Frederick Lugard, which aimed at indigenous self-rule without hindering British colonial interests. However, the British control of Nigeria's resources resulted in the decline of living standards. As the region's agricultural economy shifted towards a centralized labor system, urban populations grew, 
birthing an educated middle class that stirred resistance toward colonial authority. Amid the worsening global economy, Nigerians sought independence in the 1930s, sparked significantly by the Women's War of 1929. The formation of the Colony and Protectorate of Nigeria in 1914 united the Northern and Southern Nigeria Protectorates under British Governor-General Frederick Lugard's dual mandate system. This framework promised indigenous self-governance at local levels, so long as it did not interfere with British colonial interests. The British saw themselves as agents of civilization, tasked with imparting European heritage to the locals. However, this system allowed British economic interests to supplant Nigeria's raw materials and labor markets. The traditional agricultural economy, characterized by small farming and sharecropping, gave way to British-controlled plantations that employed wage labor compensated with British currency. This shift toward capitalism also affected urban regions, resulting in an explosion of city populations as rural Nigerians pursued prospects in colonial services and city-based businesses. Consequently, a new middle class of urban, educated, English-speaking Nigerian Christian elite surfaced, though indebted to the colonial system, they forged a core resistance against British authority. Widespread political, economic, and social changes incited resistance throughout Nigerian society, culminating in violent incidents, especially during the 1920s. As the global economy faltered in the interwar years, tolerance for colonial rule waned in Nigeria. In 1929, following the Wall Street crash, the Women's War marked a turning point in anti-colonial sentiment as women opposed the newly introduced taxation for females. Though British forces suppressed the rebellion, the event accelerated Nigeria's push for independence from colonial rule in the 1930s. Unraveling Nigeria's Nationalism By the 1930s, British colonialism in Nigeria had fostered a privileged class and local European-educated intellectuals who appreciated colonial benefits. However, most Nigerians experienced erosion of their traditions, cultures, and institutions, and their labor was exploited mainly for European interests. Following the Women's War in 1929, various nationalist unions emerged, initially based on pan-Nigerianism, but ultimately morphing into regional groups by the 1950s. Despite sharing the goal of self-governance, nationalist movements differed in strategies and ideologies. Leaders, such as Namdi, the great Zik, Azakai, were drawn from the British-educated elite class. Mass actions, like the general strike in 1945, intensified post-World War II. As a result, colonial authorities gradually ceded power through constitutional reforms in the 1950s, culminating in Nigeria gaining independence in 1960. However, the nationalist coalition's fragility soon led to ethnic strife and challenges to Nigeria's newfound peace. Nigeria's Elusive Unity In 1960, Nigeria gained independence with great expectations of becoming a wealthy and united country. However, the new nation struggled to establish a cohesive identity due to its diverse ethnicities, languages, and religions. Despite attempts to forge unity through art, politics, and economics, the lack of a shared national identity became a critical issue, leading to regional rivalries and eventually a bloody civil war. Although the country survived, the quest for national unity continues to challenge Nigerians. In the wave of post-independence optimism felt in 1960, Nigeria appeared destined to serve as a beacon of hope for Africa. With a vast population and newly discovered petroleum reserves, its anticipated wealth attracted the world's attention. However, the dream of unity faced significant roadblocks, mainly due to the varied ethnicities, languages, and religions that coexisted within the country's arbitrary borders drawn by British colonial authorities. The struggle for a collective identity led to the consolidation of political power among Nigeria's largest ethnic groups, the Hausa and Fulani in the north, the Yoruba in the southwest, and the Igbo in the southeast. Minorities within these regions felt sidelined by these dominant groups, which exacerbated divisions rather than fostering a sense of unity. Throughout the 1960s, efforts from politicians, artists, and scholars sought to instill a national identity through cultural expressions, while the government implemented initiatives aimed at promoting economic cohesion. 
Despite these endeavors, rampant corruption, electoral manipulation, and competing regional interests hindered the process of nation-building. Increasing tensions led to the belief that a united Nigeria may have been unattainable. The military's overthrow of the government in 1966 intensified these sentiments, culminating in the southeastern Igbo majority region's declaration of independence a year later. Consequently, the country descended into a devastating civil war, claiming the lives of up to three million Nigerians before reunification occurred three years later. The swift reintegration of the southeast into Nigeria could not entirely quell the pressing question of national identity. As the country moved forward, the elusive pursuit of unity remained a focal point, posing a challenge to Nigerians throughout the subsequent decades. Oil Wealth and Nigeria's Struggle Yakubu Gowan's rise to power in 1966 marked the beginning of Nigeria's reliance on oil wealth, ultimately leading to deep-seated corruption and poverty. Despite regime changes and attempts at reform, corruption persisted, culminating in an 11-year recession in 1981 as oil prices fell. The consequences were a vicious cycle of poverty, crime, inflation, and political instability, with subsequent military coups bringing new leaders who continued to struggle against the deeply rooted corruption in Nigeria. When charismatic General Yakubu Gowan took control of Nigeria in 1966, the military expanded exponentially, from 10,000 to 270,000, leading to its dominance in the nation's politics. Throughout the 1970s, Nigeria's reliance on oil revenues significantly shaped its political and economic landscape. While vast petroleum reserves made Nigeria Africa's wealthiest nation at the time, this prosperity did not extend to the majority of its people. Corruption pervaded every level of government, with only those connected to power benefiting from lucrative petroleum contracts and revenues. Most Nigerians suffered a perpetual cycle of poverty, worsened by the fact that 82% of the government's revenue came from petroleum by 1974. As global oil prices fluctuated, so did the purchasing power of ordinary Nigerians. In the meantime, traditional industries like agriculture fell by the wayside, and Nigeria even began importing palm oil, a regional staple for centuries. Endemic corruption and poverty eventually led to Gowan's undoing. When he reneged on his promise to transfer power to a civilian government, the widely supported 1975 military coup ushered General Murtala Muhammad into power. Although his initial reforms showed promise, Muhammad's assassination within six months led to another general, Olushegun Obasanjo, assuming Nigeria's leadership. Obasanjo's attempts to curtail corruption were largely futile, as purging corrupt politicians simply left room for others to take their place. However, he reclaimed one victory by returning power to civilian rule with Shihu Shigari's election in 1979, putting an end to 13 years of military dominance. Unfortunately, corruption persisted, and a drastic drop in oil prices in 1981 forced Nigeria into an 11-year recession marked by skyrocketing unemployment, crime, and inflation. These factors, coupled with electoral fraud, culminated in yet another coup in 1983, and Major General Muhammadu Buhari seized power, though the nation's struggle with corruption continued. Rising from Authoritarianism Nigeria's brief democratic period came to a halt with Buhari's coup, which resulted in 15 years of worsening socio-economic conditions under authoritarian rule. As corruption became deeply rooted, Nigerians struggled with poverty, prompting many to turn to criminal activities. The IMF's imposed structural adjustment program in 1985 only worsened the situation, leading to inflation and further scarcity of basic necessities. Despite the challenges, the oppressed society fueled the growth of civil organizations, which actively demanded change from the government. By 1999, Nigeria saw the return of democracy with the election of President Olushegun Obasanjo, who revitalized Nigeria's international image through pro-democratic rhetoric. However, the reality still held that the majority of Nigerians continued to live in poverty, with basic needs unmet. In the wake of Nigeria's failed democratic experiment, the military coup led by Buhari plunged the nation into a 15-year era of authoritarianism. With three dictators at the helm, corruption seeped into the fabric of society, 
and the economy spiraled downward. As government officials looted state funds, ordinary citizens were forced into crime to survive, leading to a surge in bribery, armed robberies, and smuggling. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, didn't make life any easier for Nigerians. In fact, it demanded repayment from the nation for previous loans, leading to the institution of the Structural Adjustment Program in 1985. This forced Nigeria to take drastic austerity measures, sell off state-owned businesses, and deregulate trade. Consequently, this worsened inflation and limited the availability of essential goods. However, this dark period unwittingly led to the growth of civil society organizations. These groups not only provided necessary goods and services to struggling Nigerians but also pressured the government for change. As conditions deteriorated, the people's demand for transformation amplified, ultimately resulting in a transition toward democracy in 1997. By 1999, Nigeria elected former military dictator Olusegun Obasanjo as president. He sought to improve Nigeria's reputation globally through pro-democratic discourse, and while foreign investment increased, genuine democratic progress was lackluster. Obasanjo's re-election in 2003 was marred by voting irregularities, and despite his tenure, the majority of Nigerians still lived in extreme poverty, devoid of essential services like healthcare and education. Nigeria's Rocky Path to Stability Nigerians experienced a historic moment on April 21, 2007, when the nation witnessed its first peaceful civilian power transition from Olusegun Obasanjo to al Haji Umari Yarajua. This significant event sparked hope that Nigeria might finally be on the path to democracy, leaving behind years of authoritarianism, economic struggles, and widespread corruption. As one of the top ten oil exporters globally, the country's potential to overcome poverty seemed promising if its wealth was distributed more evenly and transparently. However, the election was far from perfect, it was riddled with vote-rigging and irregularities, and many charged politicians belonged to opposition parties. Despite the nation's ongoing challenges, including religious divisions and deep-rooted poverty, the authors express optimism that Nigeria may still achieve its potential due to its semi-democratic, non-authoritarian rule laying the groundwork for future stability. With continued efforts to eliminate corruption and enhance education, healthcare, and infrastructure, Nigeria's future might indeed shine bright. In A History of Nigeria, Toyin Falola provides a comprehensive examination of the developmental milestones and turning points experienced by Nigeria throughout its long and intricate past. By exploring the connections between its pre-colonial existence and the political structure of the modern-day Nigerian state, the book provides necessary context to understand the nation's contemporary challenges. Through the lens of Nigeria's tumultuous past, observe its struggle for independence, the impact of European colonialism, and the various regional, ethnic, and religious complexities that continue to shape the country's identity. As the nation strives to realize its potential, A History of Nigeria presents an informative and engaging overview of the hurdles it has overcome and those that still remain, 